Section 12. A Smoker's Companion of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Except for the address, number one, Park Lane, marked with a muddy forefinger on the hanging waterproof sheet which served as a door, there was nothing pretentious about the erection, it could not be called a building, which was for the time being the residence of three drivers of the Royal Field Artillery. But the shelter, ingeniously constructed of hop poles and straw thatch, was more or less rainproof and had the advantage of being so close to the horse lines that half a dozen strides brought the drivers alongside their long-nosed chums. It was early evening, but the horses having been watered and fed, the labours of their day were over, and the wheel and lead drivers were luxuriating in bootless feet while they entertained the gunner, who had called in from his own billet in the farm's barn. The gunner was holding forth on tobacco gifts. "'It's like this, see,' he said, "'and I knows it so, cause I read it myself in the paper. First you cuts a coupon out of the paper with your name and address on it.' "'But here, hold on,' put in the wheel-driver. "'How does my name get on it?' "'You write it there, fathead. Did you think it growed there?' You write your name, same as the paper tells, see, and you cuts out the coupon and send sixpence for one pack of the back it. What, what sort of yarn you giving us now? said the wheel driver. I didn't send no sixpence or cut out a cow pan. I gets this back it for nothing. The quarter told me so. Course you gets it, said the gunner impatiently, but somebody must have paid the sixpence. Y you said I paid it. "'And I never did,' retorted the wheel-driver. "'He means,' explained the lead-driver, "'if you was sending a pack of baccy, you'd send sixpence.' "'Where's the sense in that?' said the wheel-driver. "'Why should I send sixpence when I can get the baccy for nothing? "'I got this for nothing. It's not a issue, either. Eh, "'It's a gift. Quartermaster told me so.' "'We know that,' said the gunner. "'But if you wanted to, you could send sixpence.' "'Could not,' said the wheel-driver emphatically. "'I haven't seen a sixpence since we left home. "'They even pays us in blooming French banknotes. "'And how am I going to tell, after this war's over, "'whether me pays in credit or—' "'Oh, shut it,' interrupted the lead-driver. "'Let's hear how this get things worked. "'Go on, chum.' "'Oh, yeah, it's, it's this way, see?' "'The gunner took up his tail anew. "'Suppose you wants to send a gift, or maybe you'll understand this way better. "'Suppose your best girl wants to send you a gift.' "'I ain't got no best girl,' objected the wheel-driver. "'I'm a married man, and you know it, too.' The gunner took a deep breath and looked hard at the objector. "'Well,' he said, with studied calm, "'well, uh, suppose your missus at home there wants to send you out some smokes.' "'And suppose she does want to,' said the wheel-driver truculently. "'What's it got to do with you, anyway?' With lips pursed tight and in stony silence, the gunner glared at him, and then, turning his shoulder, addressed himself deliberately to the lead-driver. "'Spose your missus,' he began, but got no further. "'He ain't got no missus, leastways he ain't supposed to have,' the wheel-driver interjected triumphantly. Uh, that fact was well known to the gunner, but had been forgotten by him in the stress of the moment. He ignored the interruption and proceeded smoothly. "'Spose your missus, if you had one which you haven't, as I well knows, seeing me and you walked out two sisters at Woolwich up to the last night we was there.' The wheel-driver chuckled. "'Thought you was on guard the last night we was in Woolwich,' he said. "'Will you shut your head and speak when you are spoken to?' said the gunner angrily. "'Never mind him, chum. What, what's, what about this gift business?' "'Well,' said the gunner, picking his words carefully, "'if a man's wife or girl or sister or friend wants to send him some smokes, they cuts this coupon, same's I've said, 
and sends it up to the paper with sixpence and the regimental number and name of the man the gift's to go to, and the paper buys the baccy, getting it cheap because of buying tons and tons, and sends a packet out with the chap's number and name and regiment wrote on it, and so he gets it, and that's all. The wheel driver could contain himself no longer. And how do you reckon I got this packet with no name or number on it? Except a postcard where a name and address wrote on as I never heard before. Because some good-hearted bloke in Blighty that doesn't have no pal particular out here asked the paper to send his packet of backy to the O.C. to pass on to some poor hard up orphan Tommy that ain't got no backy nor no friends to send him like, and he issues it to you. It isn't an issue, persisted the wheel driver. It's a gift. Quar said so himself. Splashing and squelching footsteps were heard outside. The door curtain swung aside, and the center driver ducked in, took off a soaking cap, and jerked a glistening spray off into the darkness. Another fair soar of a night, he remarked cheerfully, slipping out of his Macintosh and hanging the streaming garment in the door. Bust me if I know where all the rhyme comes from. Any luck? asked the lead driver, leaning over to rearrange the strip of cloth, which, stuck in a jam tin of fat, provided what, uh, with some imagination, might be called a light. Five packets, twenty-five pounds, said the center driver. There was two or three waiting to swap the backy in their packets for the fags and the other chaps, so I done pretty well to get five packets for mine. "'Twould have paid you better to have kept your backy and made fags out of it with cigarette papers, said the wheel driver. Maybe agreed the center driver and perhaps you'll tell me not being a masculine and cook conjurer myself how am i to produce the fag papers the gunner chuckled softly oh, <laughs> you should have done like old pint of bass did time we was on the iron he said bass is one of them fag fiends that can't live without his cigarette and wouldn't die happy if he wasn't smoking one he breathes more smoke than he does air, and he ought to have a permanent chimney sweep detailed to clear the soot out of his lungs and breathing tubes. But if Pint of Bass does smoke more than is good for him or any other respectable factory chimney, I'll admit the smoke hasn't suited up his intellect none, and he can wriggle his way out of a hole where a double-jointed snake could stick. And during the retreat, when, as you know, cigarettes in the expeditionary force was scarcer and snowballs in hell, old Pint of Bass managed to carry on, and wasn't never seen without his fag, except at meal times and sleep times, and they being so infrequent and sketchy like uh, them days of but hardly worth counting. It was like this, you see, that he managed it. You remember that when we mobilized some lost dogs home or uh, society for preventing christian knowledge or something rushes up a issue a pocket testaments and dishes out one to everybody in the battery bound in a khaki cover they was and coming in remarkable and he is a nice sentimental sort of keepsake most of them stayed behind with sweethearts and wives them as didn't must have gone into base kit "'Cause anyhow there wasn't any one to be raked out of the battery later on, "'except the one that Pont of Bass was carrying. "'Being pocket testaments, they was made of the thinnest kind of paper, "'and Bass told me the size worked out exactly right at two fags to the page. "'He started on the creation just about the time of Mons, "'and by the time we got back to the iron, he was near through Genesis.' All the time we was working up through France again, Bass's smokes were working down through Exodus, and he began to worry about whether the testament would carry him through the campaign. The other fellers that had their tongues hanging out for a fag used to go and borrow a leaf off of Bass whenever they could raise a bit of backy. But at last Bass shut down on those loans. Where's your own testament, he'd say. You was served out one same as me, wasn't you? Or a irreligious wasters get a Bible give you and can't take the trouble to carry it. You'd have sold them testaments at sixpence a sack in Woolwich if they'd been buyers at that price, which there weren't. And now here comes begging a page of mine. 
I ain't going to give you no more. Encourage and thriftlessness, as the adjutant would call it. And besides, how do I know how long this war's going to last or when I'll see a fag or a fag paper again? I'll be smoking Deuteronomy and Kings long before we're over the Rhine. And maybe, he says, turning over the pages with his thumb and tearing out the children of Israel, careful by the roots, maybe I'll be reduced to smoking the inscription to our dear soldier friend on the fly leaf before I get a chance to loot some backy shop in Berlin. No, he says, no. You're going to smoke a corner of the Pettit Journal. And good enough for you, unprovident sacrilegious blighters, you. Giving away your own good testaments. Young Soapy, of the center section, him that was struck off the strength at wipers later through stopping a coal box, tried to come the artful and add the front to alt the division padre one day and ask him if he'd any spares of pocket testaments in store making out he'd lost his through lending it to his number one who had gone missing. Soapy made out he couldn't sleep in his bed at night, which wasn't saying much, seeing we mostly slept in our seats or saddles them nights, uh, because he hadn't read a chapter of the Testament first. And the old sky pilot was a little bit surprised. He'd have been more surprised if he knew Soapy as well as I did. And he pleased, and most of all bowed down with grief because he hadn't no testament that was supernumerary to war establishment, and so couldn't issue one to Soapy. But two days later, he comes hunting for Soapy, as pleased as a dog with two tails, and smiling as glad as if he just converted the Kaiser, and he lugs out a big Bible he'd bought in a village we'd just passed through, and writes Soapy's name on the fly-leaf, and presents it to him, and tells him he'll come and have a chat any time he's near the battery. The Bible was none of your fiddling pocket things, but a good substantial one, with pictures of Moses in the bulrushes, and Abraham sacrificing his son, and such like. And the leaves was that thick that Soapy might as well have smoked brown paper or the petit journal. But that wasn't the worst of it. Soapy chucked it over the first edge soon as the padre had gone. But next day the padre rolls up and tells Soapy a sapper had picked it up and brought it to him, him having signed his name and rank after presented by on the fly-leaf. And he warns Soapy to be more careful and helps him stow it in his haversack where it took up most of the room and weighed a ton and left Soapy to distribute his bully beef and biscuits and cheese and spare socks and cetera in all the pockets he had. And even then poor Soapy wasn't finished, for every time the padre got a chance he'd hop round and have a chat, as he called it, with Soapy. The chat being a cross-examination was in a court-martial on what chapter Soapy had been reading and full explanations of same. Soapy was drove and asked to read in a chapter so he could make out his savage something of it. The gunner tapped out his pipe on the heel of his boot and began to refill it. If you'll believe me, he said, that padre got poor Soapy pinned down so he was reading near a chapter a day, which shows the horrible results that can come of a little bit of simple deception. A dow is pint of Basco and all with his testament, asked the lead driver. <laughs> he don't need to smoke it now. We're in these fixed positions and getting liberal supplies from these people what sends up to the papers tobacco funds. But he's saving up the rest of it. Reckons that when we get the Germans on the run again, the movin' will be at the trot, counter, and gallop, same's before, and the cigarette supplies won't be able to keep up the pace. And besides, he says, he reckons it's only a fair thing to smoke a cigarette made with the last chapter down the I Street of Berlin the day peace is declared. End of section 12